Ladies and gentlemen, it's 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and that means it is time for JXE Streams. My name is Anthony John Agnello, uh, Streams producer here at Engadget, and today we are playing Axiom Verge. Axiom Verge uh, is a delightfully named game uh, by a gentleman named Thomas Happ. And it is very, very much built in the vein of Metroid. It is a 2D platformer and action game that has you exploring a frightening, frightening, freaky alien world uh, that is filled with, you know, like the, the sort of Geigery, uh, Cthulhu-y mix that, is, that makes this game so special. Uh, and... Later on in the show, Thomas himself is going to be joining us to talk about his game and tell us about its inspirations and uh, the difficulties of designing a game like this. You know, and the, in the indie game world, there has been a boom of sort of interconnected uh, adventures like this. We Last week, we just played Ori in the Blind Forest. Uh, last fall, Jules Waffen of Renegade Camp released uh, Xeno Drifter, and there there are a lot of people referring to this, uh, referring to like, returning to this style of game design. Uh, although Tom Hatt's game Axiom Verge is explicitly Metroidy, not only does it sort of ape the uh, graphical style of the eight and sixteen bit era. It very much calls back to the visual uh, aesthetic design of the original Metroid on NES, but also some Turbo Graphics 16 games like Alien and Devil's Crush, and uh, Super Nintendo and Genesis games as well. Uh, so right here you can see the, the terrifying science experiment that, that keys everything off. I'm not going to tell you too much about the plot, because I think that we can actually get pretty far in. And, uh, it's fun to just see it unfold. Ah, Tree Fox really dug the new Strider. Yeah, man, that is another one. Double Helix knocked that out of the park. It really kind of broke my heart when they got bought up by, uh, Amazon just after finishing that new Strider, because they did a hell of a job on it. <laughs> yeah, everybody's talking about how much they would like to see Shadow Complex too. Uh, Shadow Complex was a wonderful little uh, Metroid-style exploration game that came out for the Xbox 360 uh, by Chair Entertainment, and they uh, they worked with Epic Games on that. And as uh, as Queen uh, Queen Hulu uh, <laughs> Queen Hulu. I'm just going to go with Queen, Queen. You were right. Uh, as Queen points out, uh, they were far too busy making iPad and iPhone games. Uh, they're, they're the ones behind Infinity Blade. So yeah, yeah, here's what happens. Right at the beginning, you wake up in this creepy little egg, and a disembodied voice just tells you to go find a gun, which is just about as upsetting as you, could, you can imagine. And, uh, yeah, we were talking about its, its Metroid styles. Much like Metroid, it tells you to go to the left first thing. And you can see, even the, even the design of the stones, uh, and the, like, blood capsules in the walls, uh, call back to the original Metroid on NES. And I'm very interested, you know, when Tom Hap's gonna join us, uh, in an hour, alongside Dan Adelman, who's helping Tom out with uh, the business side of releasing Axiom Verge. Uh, and uh, we're, we're going to talk about what it's like to make a game that so explicitly calls out to another one. You know, like, what is, what is the dividing line between homage and flat-out imitation, you know? And is there a problem with flat-out imitation? Can you straight up copy uh, another work of art and expect it to thrive in the exact same way? Uh, there's some some love for Strider 2 happening 
in the uh, in the chat right now. And can we all agree that Strider 2 is amazing? One of the best PlayStation 1 games. It's not played by nearly enough people. Uh, Flo Ben mentioned it before. The music in Axiom Verge is also just rigging and great. And I, I promise you, everyone, I am going to try as hard as I possibly can to not lose sight of what's going on in the chat, but this game can be very, very engrossing. Uh, it does a very good job. There's, there's sort of like two different schools of thought. You know, you play the original Metroid, and you could go to a lot of places right out the gate go to tons of different areas of the game. But then there are others, like, uh, say, Monster World, Monster World 4, in, in specific, wonderful Genesis game, and it really, really restricts you. You can only see, like, one or two paths to go to. And the very beginning of Axiom Verge, where I am right now, these first few rooms, you're very restricted. You can explore, you can find these paths that you're supposed to go, but you're not really, it's not really funneling you anywhere. Like, it's, it's funneling you towards one specific spot. It's really not funneling you into a big open world right away. But man, later on, a couple of hours into the game, it just becomes overwhelmingly open. You really have to get used to uh, the process of remembering where you are. Which I like. I like to. I think it's, it's a rare occasion that I get to turn on my PlayStation 4 and play a game that's going to be very demanding and, and ask me to remember a lot of different things. I recognize that's strange to say in the day that Bloodborne is coming back with. Uh, which, apparently, Bloodborne's really easy. It's a very easy game. We'll be streaming that later this week as well, so if you are disappointed that we're not playing that today, well, don't worry. Mr. White Productions. Why change the formula when the reboot was just that? Or re yeah, Yaddle! So basically, Metroid 1 versus Metroid 2. Very, very good way to summarize that in terms of the, the, the wide, wide openness and a more controlled uh, funneling through different levels. Actually, I would say Axiom Verge sort of protects its, uh, its upgrades and controls the flow through, through the early stages of the game in a similar way, not to Metroid 2, but Metroid Fusion, in that uh, you're fighting bosses to get access to the uh, weapon and other sorts of upgrades that open up the, the stages to new, new uh, avenues of exploration. <laughs> Tree Fox, yeah, there is a little bit of a Galaga thing going on. Mr. White Productions, is Mega Man X8 really considered the worst X game? I thought that would go to 6 or uh, 7. I actually love X8. That's just me. Ah, here we go. So here is the, the first item upgrade you get. The Nova. Which lets you shoot out these little pink balls, but if you tap the shoot button again, which is a square. And this is very useful for not really taking out enemies. The gun is pretty weak. You will find, and we'll find them pretty quickly, gun upgrades that increase the size and the power of your bullets across the board for all of your guns. Uh, but even as you find those upgrades, this little the Nova gun is not very useful for combat. And you can change guns using the right stick as a wheel, which is a great little touch. It's very nice and keeps things easy. So, uh, you know, given the Metroidiness, it's, it's 
start having to think about the things that you would like for Metroid's weapon upgrade system. It's something that I love in the Metroid games that you really don't see anywhere uh, in games that have you collecting these weapons and stuff like that. Uh, you never see the weapon stack uh, where you'll find, like, the Ice Beam! And then, all of a sudden, the, you know, the Ice Beam also... Jeez, I'm gonna die. Uh, you know, the Ice Beam will not be cancelled out by finding the Wave Beam, it'll just become a Wavy Ice Beam, and so on and so forth. Oh, jeez. That's uh, another thing that speaks to this game's favor, although it really depends uh, on what you look for in the game. It is incredibly difficult. Trey Fox, what would you say is your current favorite Metroidvania game, and how does Axiom Verge compare? Jeez. Uh, favorite of all time, I'm assuming. Uh, like, the one that I love more than any of them. Uh, God, it's really hard. Yeah, it's really, really hard to say. Uh, I love... I, you know, I, there, there are the obvious ones that I adore. I think Super Metroid is... An amazing game. The original Metroid trilogy across the board is just spectacular. But, uh, you know, Symphony of the Night as well. Uh, although, I wouldn't necessarily say Symphony of the Night is, like, the best of the Castlevania uh, exploration games. I, I think that, that probably, that, that award goes to Order of Ecclesia, the 2008 Castlevania for Nintendo DS. That game is spectacular. Uh, man, my favorite Metroidvania. Jeez. I like. Let's let's say. How about this? Favorite Metroidvania that's not a Castlevania or a Metroid. So something something from outside of those realms. Uh, Monster Hunter Four or Monster Hunter Four, Monster World for for Sega Genesis. Moon's High on that list. Uh, Dust and Elysian Tale uh, is also excellent, and I cannot recommend it enough if you guys haven't played it. Uh, this is not a game that is conducive to taking a sip of coffee every now and again, let me tell you. Same sort of uh, same sort of layout. Oh God, your chagrin, Guacamele. Guacamele is so good. Oh my gosh, I love, love, love Guacamele. Uh, and hopefully we're going to be having uh, the folks from Drinkbox Studios on the stream in the not too distant future. Uh, talking with them about coming on to take a look at uh, their upcoming game, uh, God, which I now can't remember the name of. It's a touch-based game, which actually looks very, very cool. It's got an interesting sort of riff on the guacamole art style. I know I said that I've been playing Axiom Verge with some regularity, but I can't totally remember where to go. Yodel, I'm not sure if this counts as a Metroidvania game, but I recently played through Muramasa on the Vita, and that was quite fun. You know, it's not like... <clears throat> it's not like a direct corollary, because you're really, like... 
your your abilities really aren't changing that much in, you know, uh, in World of Mods. It's not really about, like, the way you move in the environment. It's not like, you don't get high jump moves and stuff like that. You guys can see, by the way, that save points are just far enough away to make you very nervous about finding them. Uh, which is great. I, that's great design. Is the fact they're they're, they're never where, right where you want them to be. You're always just about to die. Uh, but yeah, y'all. To, to get back to your point uh, about Muramasa, which is a wonderful game by Vanillaware. You guys haven't played it. Uh, it's got that lush, hand-drawn look that Vanillaware has sort of specialized in since they, they began way back in the 90s making Saturn games like Princess Crown. Alright, here's a great spot. This little between room with the red door always pops up before a boss, which is another thing that Metroid has done in the past, and a lot of these games do, uh, of like giving you like a moment to prepare before a boss. Castlevania always shows you this green glowing door that will slide up before you go into a boss room, and Metroid always has a door before the boss that has a giant, like, disgusting eye growing out of it. You have to destroy the eye before you go in. I love how creepy, and here's, like, sort of where you get sort of, like, the Lovecraftian eldritch horror of Axiom Verge here, is I love the, the creepy, like, what is that? hanging in the background. Is that a skull? Is it a bone? Like, is it a rib cage? It's freaking gross. I love that. I think it's so cool. Your chagrin, I'm surprised no one has tried to do a Metroid Prime knockoff. Seriously? <laughs> Where are those first-person adventure games, man? Like, does Dishonored count? Even then, not not as not as interconnected a, a series of levels. Not even Bioshock really counts. <clears throat> Here's the first boss. I love the eighties most of the music too. <laughs> Tree Fox. Oh, Reef Cage made of spine. <laughs> Oh, 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 crap. We'll see this as we get through the screen. Because the first few bosses are, are nicely spaced out, uh, but not too far apart. And... I love, like, this one is very, very straightforward. You know, shoot, shoot the bottom of But they get very, very big and very, very complex very, very fast. And I like that there is uh, there's a little bit of puzzle solving in so far as it's, it's not immediately apparent how to hurt the bosses right out of the game. Oh! oh. Ah! Now what? <laughs> A hovering robo anus. Yeah, Tree Fox. I think hovering robo anus is a very apt description. I would go with that. I support that description in every way. <clears throat> And here comes the, yeah, the laser drill. Yeah, this is, there we go. This is one of the coolest little variations on the format. Like, you, you know, you play an exploration game like this, there tends to be a <coughs> similar items, you know. Like, there's no, there's no escaping the influence that Metroid had back in the 80s. Uh, and 90s, so certain things are tend to be copied, like uh, a bomb, you know, a, a bomb to break through bricks and get to where you need to go. Great. Uh, Axiom Verge, as much as it calls back to Metroid, as much as it is influenced by uh, the aesthetics of an older game, 
it really comes up with some wonderful new ideas in the drill as well. Uh, it's tricky to use the drill. Uh, you can't just, like, go down and automatically be drilling through the blocks beneath you. You have to, like, jump up in the air first and then slide back down and, and land, like, facing down to start doing it, like, like, ow, oh, come on. Crunch Chewy, uh, yeah, uh, as, as Axiom Verge in the chat, uh, which I believe is Tom Hat, who will be on the air with us shortly, uh, is saying it's, uh, it's the, because the stream is streaming at 30 frames per second, and the flick, flicker effect, uh, is impacted. The game, as always, we're, we're using an Elgato, uh, HD. Uh, today, and, um, we're streaming at 720p at 30 frames per second, because that is the, the settings that lets my internet connection and Twitch play nicely together, uh, and I can assure you that what you're seeing on the stream, even if you're viewing this at the source resolution, is not nearly as good looking as the game is. Oh my god, can I just do that? Oh my god. I died because I was talking to you people. Not because, not because I'm bad. Oh dear god. You died when we saved your mind machines. That is the, the eerie technological beings that run this planet. Uh, and that have summoned you for assistance. They're dealing with a they're dealing with a little bit of a problem here. <laughs> Tree flags, not excuses. Stop judging me. How you doing here? Do I still have? Yeah, I still have everything. Nope, wrong door. Ah! Now who's not dead, purple bug monsters? There's something else that I, I think is essential for a sort of spooky science fiction game like this, which is the feeling of descent. Like you're falling further and further and further into this place. Tree Fox, can you pull up a bigger map or is it just the mini map? Here is the larger map. Now, what you see on the left, it will ultimately be the big map. And as you get to different areas, that fills out more and more and more. And you, there are like sort of different, you know, countries or states that you go through uh, with, throughout this cave. Not dissimilar to like your Norfair, uh, your criteria, etc. So I'm in Erebu, the Erebu sec section right now of uh, of the map, and that's the very first place. Oh, can't get through those yet. We need a tool. I, I, I love, too, there's a great pace to putting a wall between you and making sure it's like a different sort of wall where you're thinking, I don't even know, I don't even know how I'm possibly going to get past that. There's no variation on the things that I am using now that can get me through that wall. Uh, Mr. White Productions, this is a press copy of the game uh, provided to us by Sony. Uh, it was sent to us a couple of weeks ago, and I, I don't think it has dramatically changed since then. I don't think I've seen it. Any serious updates. 
God, in in my other playthrough of this, I it's been so long since I've been in this section of the game that I am now seeing places that I still haven't gone through. I'm like, oh, I need to come back here. I need to check this out. So you guys can see it's right above me right now where I'm pointing my gun. There's that little red orb, and that little ball up there is uh, a health expansion. You get four of those little ones, and it will boost up your life. Oh, actually, oh wait, that might be... is that for the weapon expansions? We're gonna find out. We'll go up there and get that thing. Oh, I can't get that thing. I can't jump that high yet. Da! Hack! So as you can see, just even now, you know, we've been playing for... Ah, there we go, there's the big ball. That is a weapon upgrade. Nope, that is a health. Nice. And here we go into the, the second map. And uh, the first big music change. We're in Absu. Uh, and Absu is where the, the plot of the game starts to take on a little shape. Why am I drilling through that wall? Why not? Because it's fun. And I like the taste. <laughs> Doesn't have flavor. Those rocks. Single and loving it. You ain't kidding, man. Never a double, double, never a double jump right when you need it. God, I love the save rooms. It seems like such a small thing, you know. You think to yourself, "Oh, save rooms. You don't even need save rooms anymore. Give me an auto save feature. Save it like every single time I go into a new room. Why do I need a save room?" The, the risk reward factor added by having a save room. Being like, oh my god, I'm so far away from this place of security. But also the the, uh, the wonderful design opportunity you have to make something that adds like a layer of visual richness to your world is just really, really cool. I love how the save rooms in Axiom Verge make this place all the stranger. It's a nice little uh, secret room. Swirl the way. I love that. That little wall that you just think, oh, I don't need to go through there. Wise to your hidden walls, Tom. Wise to them. Oh, God. And here, you break through the wall. And into a, a new type of memory. Which, look at him. He just seems to be having. He just seems to be having a little bit of a respiratory problem. But, oh, I don't have much health. Let's... Yeah! They will come after you. Leaping little freaks that they are. God, and the world is just so... Like, for every bit as beautiful it is, it's also vile. Like, just pulsing, gross, blood vessel -y walls. Here is this really cool, uh, and we'll we'll talk about this once Tom comes on the show in just a bit. Uh, the manufactured glitch aspect of the game, the the sort of uh, manipulating the, the environment to both be an indicator of environmental damage, but also uh, sort of replicating uh, the the freakouts of hardware from the 80s. Uh, unfortunately, you're not getting the full effect of the flickering environments because we are streaming at 720 at 30 frames per second. Uh, but you can still see it flickering just a little bit on the stream, uh, although it looks even more severe because of the lower frame rate of what you're seeing as opposed to what I'm playing. Yaddle, like the final level of Contra. Yeah, very much so, very much so. 
Tree Fox, yes, you can jump higher at some point. Uh, that is not too terrible a spoiler. I love, too, like, you finally get to this area and there's just... bodies sitting at tables. Miranda. No, not Miranda. This is not... Not a Firefly reference. Okay, I do not want to go that far left yet. Blue Hermit Dog, like the flood levels in Halo and Tree Fox, like the end of System Shock 2, both very accurate. Spot on. I want to... is this the way? Yeah, alright, thank god. <laughs> Dark Lurker 23, next gen games! Yeah, this is next gen, man. Uh, I have also been playing this a lot using the remote play feature. Uh, ah, here we go, here we go. Here is the first thing. What are they? I don't know. Elsa Nova, your parents were hippies. Speaking of hippies, the main character kind of looks like the guy who would sell you a burrito outside of a fish concert. Topical references? Not topical references? Is that a thing anymore? Do people buy burritos at fish concerts? Sleep it off, thou dork! Gonna take a look at that. She says she's four feet above the covers. Ah, Jack! Jack, get off of me! You leaping freak! Mithra in here, do people still go to fish concerts? The question. Your your guess is as good as mine, man! I don't have an answer to these questions. It's like that old Toya song. It's a mystery. God. These are these are dated even for me. There we go. Oh man, can I alright. <laughs> Looks like the tall. <laughs> The tall dork from Avatar, opposite Sam Worthington. So, just because I'm that kind of player and I know that I left it up there, there is an item that I can now get thanks to this new lightning gun. Is it? Oh god, I can't reach up there either. Da! I thought I could jump back up. I can't. I can't! Uh, the lightning gun is super cool, because it is powerful, it is useful in a lot of combat situations. Uh, it's not just useful because it shoots through walls. Like, you know, you can actually, like, reach something that's above this platform if there was something above that platform. Uh, but, like, you start to rely on it, you're like, oh! This, this lightning gun is really powerful, so I'm just going to use it all the time. And it becomes really dangerous really, really quickly. Uh, because you think, oh, I, I can stay in a safe spot and just use that through a wall. That's it. Uh, not the case. Not the case. You can die really, really quickly if you start doing that. Right, you did. How do you do, man? Good to see ya. Oh, go, God. Usually, uh... So if you guys haven't noticed, health drops are not super common. But the nice thing is, is usually if you are fighting against a enemy that is pretty beefy, they will typically drop a lot of health after you finally kill them. Uh, as with Ceiling Octopus there. Oh, Ceiling Octopus, you scamp. And get back. Am I? 
Where am I? And where are we going? No! Oh, leave me alone, vomiting plant! Here we go. That's the good stuff. Pow! Walk in on that. Oh, so you need five of the tiny reds to get a full health upgrade. That is more than I remember. What the hell was you jumping, zombie? I'm tired of your business. to really quickly try to go up again. Because I don't remember where I'm supposed to go first. Or if there are any items that I want to pick up before progressing. That's right, that's why I can't get through there. Okay. Everything is clear now. I understand the world. That's another thing is that it's really, really well balanced in the game. It's quite uh, enemy that's, that's another thing that you just sort of like don't think about when you're playing a game, usually. Uh, you don't really think about, like, oh my god, when is a good time, if I go back in this room, when should the enemies be there? Because if you kill that leaping zombie and then run out of the room and then all of a sudden think, oh, I want to go back in there, I want to go back in there right now. I forgot something. Uh, you don't want him to be there again. You just killed him. That, that's really going to kill the pace of the game. That's really going to make things feel, you know, sort of stilted and inconvenient. But, in Axiom Verge, you go in, there's, it's gone. There's nothing there. Uh, and... But, for more than a few minutes, go through a different few rooms, and, yeah, he'll be back. And that's really cool. Uh... Yeah, no! No! Ha <laughs> ha! Come here, guys. Like so. There you go. You don't like that. Ha! Y'all will just be thankful this isn't Ninja Game on the NES. Yes! Endless respawns! Now that's... The height of fairness. Alright, I can't get this item. Cannot get this until I get an ability later in the game, which is one of the most unusual abilities that I have seen added to this thing. And I, I'm excited to talk about that with Dan and Tom when we bring them in. Because you get a coat that will push you through walls. Uh... It doesn't mean, like, all of a sudden you can just, like, sort of phase through everything. It, like, it, it's super weird. Like, you have to press really hard against a wall, and then you can... ...pop through. And here is one of the creepiest rooms in the game. Just... bodies. A lot of bodies. Uh, so I don't know if it's become readily evident, but, uh, uh yeah, something really bad happened here. <laughs> something very not good happened, uh, in Axiom Verge. Something far worse than just a, a botched science experiment in the year 2005. Just another... Oh, Queen, yeah! I, absolutely, the Castlevania boss, Legion, uh, <clears> that <throat> shows up in Symphony of the Night and a bunch of other ones. It's just like a writhing mass of bloated white corpses. Deeply upsetting boss. Speaking of bosses... Blue <laughs> Dog. Yeah, a freaking mountain of bodies! That's not upsetting at all! Not even vaguely. Just not that upsetting. <laughs> There's our ribcage of spines again. Here we go with boss number two. 
Roy G. Biff, so was there any backstory so far at all? There is a second of backstory at the beginning. You see you see a brief scene where our, our hero here is working in a science lab on Earth in 2005. Some business goes down, and he is caught in an explosion that lands him in a very unusual place. And this is a very unusual place. But it's not abundantly clear what the hell is going on. And we for a goodly while, at least until a few hours into the game. Which is awesome. I like it a lot. It's a lot of really good environmental storytelling like those giant piles of bodies. <coughs> you got to like the RNC, am I right? Hey, um. Yeah, this thing, he does have some sideburns. He's got, he's got them chops. Oh, that's right, alright. Only damage uh, demon Jesse Ventura here by shooting him in the bulbous mass of yellow juice. I'm gonna say on his back. The enemy design is disgusting. Something I do like a lot about this game is in all of the things that it replicates from the classic games. One of the things that it's not replicated is, you know, uh, uh, something like, you know, if the enemy is off screen, you can no longer interact with it at all. Uh, this would be a very, very frustrating boss if you weren't still connecting hits when it's off screen. I am probably going to die. Yeah. I'm going to die. Ah! Oh. Ugh, <sighs> Yaddle, I was aiming for the soft pulsing bits, and then he shot me directly in my soft pulsing bits. This is not the kind of show where we're going to talk about soft pulsing bits, I promise. I promise you. <laughs> my fellow Americans. I don't even, I have no idea. I don't know why. <clears throat> Mayor Diamond Joe Quimby was in my head earlier. That might have been why. He's red, that means he's happy. That's how you know! Oh, damn it. <coughs> Playing an action game like this on the screen, guys, it's hard to keep the squares to a minimum. For moments, an Axiom Bird makes you just want to start in like, Come on! Come on! Why I wanna... <coughs> Oh, much better this time. A lot of the, the double tapping of the jump button and the shoot button at the same time. Come on! There we go. There we go. You don't like it? I don't like it either! Just stop shooting the giant bazooka thing at me. This wouldn't be happening. Ha ha! Ha ha! Now where are your pulsing back parts, buddy? Exploded into giblets. Get your giblets out of here. Now that might seem like I was the jerk. I came into his home. He was just minding his own pulsating red back business. Yellow back at the beginning, forgive me, not, not totally red. And what is this one? Yeah, yeah, all right. This is the other cool item in the game. Uh, so, yeah, not, not a gun, but another thing that you use to warp the terrain a la, uh, a drill. So, you use this to target parts in the background that are pitching out and change their properties. So here, it's just an issue of <coughs> hitting platforms and making them physical, which is, is really cool and creates an interesting 
platforming opportunities. And this is just a marvelous room all around because it shows how versatile that can be. So now it wants you to warp these levels. And that makes them solid as well. So this doesn't just hold true for the bubbles uh, or these platforms. You can do this to enemies as well later in the game. <coughs> and when you warp them, you glitch them out like this. It turns them into something else entirely. Uh, there's some nice secrets later in the game. Secret areas in the map that... Just, just, oh, alright, that just brings me back to me. <clears throat> we don't want to go right to the thing. We're going to continue exploring. To the right! Always to the right! <laughs> Everything in an exploration game like this is different than in JFK. Instead of back and to the left, it's forward and to the right. Forward and to the right. Always forward. That's my rule. Too dark? Too soon? <laughs> Never do it. Never do it. Never do it. Never do it. Somebody called him out. Ah, yeah, here we go. So, a really cool little section of the game. You see these guys hidden in the walls, and then you start using a little warp thing. You warp them, and they break over the walls for you. Thank you, little guys. There we go. I think I need them to break more of those things, though. Twirling towards freedom! Tiny American flags for some! Oh, I can't. Right. <clears throat> By the way, just because they're glitched out doesn't mean that they can't hurt you. Which, uh, that took me a while to learn that properly. Nice. Nice little weapon upgrade for the trouble. Size node! And that is the name for the JXE Streams Metal Band. Finally. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Size Node! I am your host, Odorous Non Rungus. Oh, Odorous. Positron plays, yeah, the soundtrack is unfreaking believable. <clears throat> There's another spot that I have not been able to get through yet. <laughs> Tree Fox, I will now rename my soft bit size node. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's a family show. We don't talk about size nodes like that. It's gonna happen to you when you work these dudes. So, something that is constantly happening to me when I play this game is. I will <clears throat> move to start aiming my weapon with the right analog stick. Which, in a lot of situations, would make the game very easy. Uh, if you weren't just having to jump up in the air to redirect how you're firing. And the, the right stick <clears throat> doesn't, doesn't change how you aim. The right stick is how you select which weapon you're using. Uh, but that's just a moment of like showing like how custom to to stick design uh, I have become, and many players have become. If you're using a controller, you expect to <coughs> have that right stick be used for something that manipulates, you know, that's going to manipulate the way you move, or the way the camera moves. You think it's going to be in some way associated with movement. <coughs> Oh! 
Oh my god! You can redirect it! Oh my god! I don't even know what to do now. Tom, change my world. Ten minutes, everybody, and Tom Half will no longer be just hanging out in the chat with y'all. Uh, he will be on the air, answering your questions in real time. And, uh, making fun of the way I play this video game. <clears throat> what Tom doesn't know is that I couldn't use the L1 trigger to redirect my uh, beam because I've been playing on Vita and I had to change L1 to be my drill. Dig it! Can't get through here yet. another very, very cool section where these little pink nodes, these little pink bulbs and lines growing out of the environment are truly repulsive. Uh, like, David Cronenberg would play Axiom Bird and be like, dude, that's a little gross. Uh, <clears throat> But those little, little nodes could be platforms, and you can accidentally destroy them. Thinking that it would somehow leave you a secret in the game, I spent a long time trying to destroy every single one of those nodes in that game. Octopus, I'm not coming up there until you leave. Power Node! Power Node is the spin-off band of Size Node. It's a totally different kind of music, everybody. Oh! I hate these enemies. God. Tom, you finally created something almost as annoying as the Medusa heads in Castlevania. These little green ball dudes that rush at you after you fire on them once. So close to a save point. So close to an everything. Ah! No! Oh, oh. oh my god. <laughs> you ought to learn those just the hunchbacks from Castlevania. They don't hop though. They don't, they don't, like, oh, god, that, that just sent me so far back. I, god, that is a crippling feeling when you die, and you have like, oh, where is that save point? How am I going to get to a save point? And I am just so far away. Another beautiful touch, though, is you don't lose your items or map progress if you die and you're not near a save point. It just sends you physically back, which is a nice, nice, nice balancing of, uh, of the, uh, of the challenge that's in place. <clears throat> see how quickly I can get back where I was in the before times a long, long ago. Change your weapon. 
Good question, Fat Buddha. Because I'm stubborn. Because I wanted to keep it real. Ah. Steam! It's not even like cool steam. Keep just the right amount of distance between you and those little green dudes. <clears throat> Go. Oh, glitch ray on the scorpions, huh? I didn't think of that. Oh, look at how sickly they get. That's weird. I feel like I just used a biological weapon against them. Everybody, Tom Hap is better than a subscription to Nintendo Power. Boy, am I going to be happy when he's actually on this phone with us. Just in it's going to be beautiful. Take that, you green ball. Now who is slow? All right. Making some progress here, everybody. Save point. right back in just a moment. And by we, I mean I. <laughs> Queen, now who's slow? Now who's slow forever? Hi, right, everybody, just uh, bear with me here in the save room. We're going to be switching uh, slightly over for just a second as uh, we go to bring our good friends Tom Edelman and Thomas Hack on the line. Just here to listen to that sweet, sweet savory music. You guys like that? The, the looking down, clearly looking down at a different screen than ever. <laughs> Hello, gentlemen. <laughs> Perfect. That's what I like to see. Uh, everybody uh, joining us on the line right now are, are Tom Hap and Dan Adelman. Uh, you guys are going to be hearing them. Please let me know if there is any issue with the audio. Uh, I want to make sure you guys hear them quite all right. I can hear you guys, but I want to make sure everybody on the stream can. Tom, speak for me. I am speaking now. <laughs> and Dan, now you... Now slow. <laughs> Tom, damn your scorpions! Damn their eyes! Everybody in the chat, please let me know if you guys have any issues with the sound, and we can change that really quickly on the fly to make sure that you can hear everybody. All right, Tom is quiet. Somebody is quiet. Audio settings. And what I... A little bit louder. Does that help? That will help, and I'm going to turn down the music on the game just a, just a scooch. Which should help. Queen is saying uh, the game audio is a little bit too loud. Tom, this is going to help when you 
Nope. Okay. Uh, okay. I... Some words. <laughs> quiet. Thanks. You sound good. We get into this game. We get into this game audio a little. That should help. Options. There's no option for game audio in here. We could do that right in OBS though. Uh, damn it, John! Where are the game options? Why can't I run this in 480i on a CRT TV perfectly? I'm kidding. That's not a thing that it should have to do. It's completely made up. Uh, it was in, in, in a uh, upcoming patch, but not at launch. <laughs> not at launch. Not at launch. When will I be able to play this on a Hue card for the PC engine? Uh, no. All right. There we go. Got the game audio down a little. And that should help everybody. And Tree Fox actually has a question for you, Tom. I just noticed the speedrun option there. What does that do? Uh, so that sets you in speedrun mode, starts you off with a, a new game. Um, the difference being that any kind of cutscenes or dialogue are eliminated. Um, and. Uh, there's also going to be an on-screen timer, basically mm -hmm. showing, you know, how far you've gotten. And also, as you defeat bosses, it puts a checkpoint in there. Oh! So, uh, you know, the idea is for, you know, streaming your, your competitive runs um, against others, and they can see what you did, and then you can, you know, hopefully uh, post them to... Uh, you know, one of those websites like, uh, was it Speed Demos Archive, that kind of thing. Mm. Uh, everybody, I now that we seem to have, like, uh, evened out some of the audio issues, uh, we can get back going. I can give you guys a proper welcome. Tom, uh, Dan, welcome. Thank you for joining me here on JXE Streams. Uh, this is awesome. I'm, I'm really glad that you guys were available to do this. Uh, just, to, just to get things... Like started right off the bat, Tom uh, and Dan, can you guys introduce yourselves and and talk a little bit about your background and how how you guys teamed up uh, for Axiom Verge? You know, Dan, like, did you approach Tom like saying, "Hey, let me take care of some of this nitty gritty stuff"? Tom, how did you create the game? Tom, you go first. Um. Yeah. So I actually uh, have been working on the game for about five years. Um, so it, when I started on it, it was just a kind of hobby project, and uh, I was working on it nights and weekends and that kind of thing. Um, and it didn't really become a uh, full-time, you know, like uh, doing this for a living deal until around uh, March of 2014. Um, that's when I finally persuaded Sony to give me their pub fund mm. agreement. So. Um, you know, what that is, is it, it, it guarantees you some advanced royalties um, to, you know, give you some, like, security. And once I did that, then I was, I felt, you know, um, safe enough to start working on this full-time rather than working at, you know, I was working at Petrol with Games before. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe it was around, like, August that Dan uh, had announced his departure from Nintendo and that he wanted to start working... Um, in a business capacity in for indie games, mm. um, and I contacted him and met up at Pax Prime, uh, and you know that that went pretty well, and uh, the rest is as they say history. Wow, this all came together fairly quickly then. I mean, relatively speaking, I know I know that was six months ago, uh, Pax Prime, or, or even more than that now, seven eight months ago, but really, like in the Dan, I know you can attest to this. In in the in the business of video games, that is that is a very uh, short period of time. Yeah. Well. Um, yeah. So I, I should probably take a step back because I I've got to assume that most people have no idea who I am. <laughs> right. Um, I should probably introduce myself a little bit um, and get some of that context. Um, so I used to run the digital distribution business at Nintendo for about nine years. Um, I'm somewhat well known among the uh, in the indie development community but I think um, there are some like um, some gamers who actually know who I am but I think it's pretty rare because I'm more of like an industry person rather than like an outward facing 
kind of uh, person. So, sure. Uh, yeah, so back in August, um, I announced that I was leaving Nintendo um, and just wanted to do my own thing and working uh, on a much more close basis with indie developers. And, you know, when I started that, I, I wasn't really sure what kinds, of, what kinds of things I would be doing, if there was any interest. Um, I kind of just had to go out on a lark because I knew that there were a lot of indie developers who, you know, who were passionate about making great games, but really didn't know um, how to go about the business side. And a lot of people were making some pretty common mistakes. So, mm. um, so yeah, so it was about a month after that, um, that announcement that Tom reached out to me. Um, and Axiom Birds was actually, like, probably my idealized if I, if I had to kind of idealize a game that I would want to work on, um, that would have been it. So I'm really lucky that that you know we were able to work together because um, you know I, I I wanted to make sure that I was working on something that I could be really passionate about. And you know having played Axiom Verge from beginning to end about five or six times now, and I still fire it up just because not for work, just because it's fun. Um, it's it's like a dream project for me. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, I, Tom, you were saying, like, this started as just something you were doing in your spare time, this labor of love five years ago. But, like, let me tell you, you know, when I sit down to play this game, this doesn't feel like something that was somebody's, you know, spare time project. This doesn't feel like something that was, you know, like, oh, it's the thing that I'm messing around with, and, and you know, maybe it'll be kind of cool. This feels like a professional game that was was made by a team of people, you know, not not just one human being. You know, that's it's really hard to to make something of this quality when you're all on your own. You know, they're usually games are made by teams of people because it's very hard to make music and art and design the actual gameplay and all that stuff. So I, I guess this is a perfect question for both of you, considering what you were just saying, Dan. Why? Is this type of game the thing that, you know, is the idealized version for you? Tom, why did you want to make uh, this sort of Metroid-inspired sort of game? And, like, forgive me if I just automatically bust out the name, because it's it's hard to get away from the Metroidness of, of Axiom Verge. I mean, right down to, the like, some of the tile design in the backgrounds, like, automatically recalls that game. And, Dan, like, why, why are you drawn to this type of game, why I know you're passionate about indie games, but what specifically about this type of game sort of gets your goat? So Tom, for, for, oh, you want to start with Tom and yeah. why he made the game? That's Absolutely. Right. Yeah, we'll go. We'll start there. We'll start there. All right. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, I yeah, it, it, it really was just uh, a hobby thing for me. Um, when when I started it, I was trying to see if I could. Um, combine elements from a few of my favorites and actually in my first iteration I was thinking that uh, it would be um, like a combination of Bionic Commando and Rygar oh um, yeah because I, I, I thought that the, the disc armor yo-yo um, weapon the way it goes back and forth was very similar to how the grapple, grappling hook works in Bionic Commando and I thought there might be a way to combine that um, and uh, so I had this idea of like the, the, the transforming uh, the weapon that he has now is kind of like a bug and that originated as this like transforming bug weapon mm. that, um, you know it it was not only a weapon but um, it could even uh, it, it would actually transform into like a little vehicle um, you know with wheels and have have like a kind of blaster master aspect to it um, so you were hitting like literally every single one of the most interesting things released between 1986 and 1988 is what you're telling me um you think you know, what was interesting to me yeah so it you know and, and it didn't originally wasn't so overtly metroid looking because uh you know the the kind of level designs i was looking at were actually more like I really liked how Shatterhand looked and how mm. um, Ness Batman looked, um, and they're you know they're they're less divided into discrete little blocks and more of like a continuous environment. Right. Um, but uh, where the Metroid comes in is uh, you know once I kind of backed away from the 
the Bionic Commando Rygar and I had this drill weapon where you can drill through blocks and and have, you know, and also glitchable blocks that each have different properties. I wanted to make the blocks more apparently so blocks. You don't mm. telegraph that each one has different attributes. So uh, then I began taking levels that I had already made that, you know, looked you know, were more in that fighting uh, a commando or shatter hand style and dividing them up into little pieces like that. So, um, you know, it, it wasn't so much Metroid as at the start, but it became more like that uh, as I progressed. Like, I decided, like, the melee weapon wasn't so fun um, uh, as a disc armor uh, grappling hybrid because... Um, for one, it couldn't go up in a diagonal if it was supposed to be your main weapon. Mm. Um, so, you know, I decided to be more versatile if I just have this be a gun, but the sorts of different ammunition it can use are different. Um, so I've still got those features, but they're they're more like just one of many as opposed to the main focus of the game. So why, why, why these games, though? You know, like, it's... It, it, I, I, I mean, I can understand the appeal of making something like that in my head is, all right, well, it's got Blaster Master, and it's got the, the grappling hook physics of NES uh, Bionic Commando, and it's got, like, that wonderful sort of chunky art that you would see in everything Sunsoft made on the NES. But, like, you know, I, I know why those stick out for me, because I grew up with those games. That, to me, is, like, my formative idea of what a video game should be. But why why are you still drawn to them as in terms of designing your own video game? What about those still feels contemporary to you? Um, I, I would say I mean I'm I'm not particularly interested in in being contemporary or, or you know worried about uh, whether I'm you know doing something fashionable or something mm. um, archaic. It, it's more just about what I thought would be enjoyable. Um, and, you know, in terms of actually making the assets, like figuring out, um, how I'm going to, you know, make 10 hours worth of content and not drive myself insane while doing so, um, I think, you know, a lot of it is just because it's more enjoyable to make, you know, these, these small bite-sized things. I, you know, uh, professionally I've been, um, a 3D animator. Um, and a modeler and a programmer, and uh, I had tried making an indie game out of like 3D model geometry. But the thing is that you know to do a room in a 3D style is just takes you know that much more effort. You know maybe it takes like four times as the amount of time to uh, get the room completed to how you would like than say a 2D game and. Uh, you know, rather than having worked on this for, you know, four years before I got the pub fund, it might have been 16 or something. Or, mm -hmm. or else it would have had to have been a, a much shorter game, which I didn't want. Um, you know, these, these are kind of things I found out gradually, just like by living life. And, you know, uh, by the time I started this, I kind of was like, okay, like the limitations I'm going to impose here are that it's going to be two dimensional and it's a size of mm -hmm. Um, you know, I could have gone like 16-bit, 8-bit, 32-bit, you know, within those parameters, but, uh, I think, you know, it's, it just comes down to what felt right to me. And man, like, that really shows. It really, really shows at sort of every inch of Axiom Verge. Like, nothing feels out of place, and... While it does recall these old things, you know, I, I did bring up Metroid, it does recall Metroid, but it never feels like anything besides its own beats. Like, every every single thing in it feels distinct, and it's it's identifiable as its own, you know, its own universe, and no piece of it feels out of place. You know, uh, before you guys came on the call, I was talking about how, like, even something as simple as, you know, the way enemies respawn feels pitch perfect in this game. Like, if you leave the room, they're not automatically all back. But if you go through a few different rooms, then they're there. And, like, that that's just... 
the type of consideration that is... It's very rare. It's very rare. Uh, Dan, you know, I know I asked you what sort of... What appeals to you about this sort of game? Why is this, like, the ideal thing that you want to represent? So, for me, you know, one of the reasons that I... I, like, I might... <clears throat> my thinking was first in terms of, like, the games I like to play rather than, like, any kind of, like, business kind of relationship. Um, the reason I really like this kind of game is because... for a couple of reasons. One is it's familiar um, and, and yet uh, unique, and I think you, you articulated that really well about how it, it reminds you of other things you've played, but it's always been its own thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, um, that, that was definitely something that I felt uh, right off the bat. And I think there's also a reason why we feel so much nostalgia for this type of game and are drawn back to it. And I, I don't think it is, you can only attribute that to, well, that was what you played in your youth. And if you played something else in your youth, that's what you would have been drawn to. I think the reason that we keep going back to these games um, and are inspired by them is because the tight controls just make for a really good feeling game mm. that you feel like you have really good control over what you're doing. Um, there's interesting gameplay. Uh, Tom was able to do a lot of interesting things that weren't possible technologically back then, like the whole glitch mechanic. Um, but you, it everything feels very tight. And, you know, when you look at indie games that are kind of um, going back for the kind of retro look and feel, um, or kind of being inspired by some of those classics, it's interesting to note that, like, even though technology has advanced a lot, you know, people who came of age in, say, the PlayStation 1 era mm. aren't making graphics, or at least not deliberately making graphics that look like PlayStation 1 era games. They're not making really blocky polygon, you know, like... Dan, are you telling me that the low... you telling me that the low poly look isn't sexy as hell, man? Come on. <laughs> I want every everything to look like a triangle all the time. Forever. <laughs> yes. So, you know, like, like, let's just do Virtua Fighter again. Like, For that was... <laughs> I remember that, like, being blown away by that, you know, back in the day. Just thinking, like, wow, it moved like a real human, and, you know... And so, you know, at the time, it, it, it worked well, but it didn't age particularly well. And I think um, there's something about really precise controls that, you know, a tile set based game can can give you because, you know, each each tile um, can have its own properties. You know exactly when you're moving across the world, like where exactly you are, where you can jump from, where you can shoot to, um, and it all lines up perfectly. So it, it, it makes for a really good gameplay. There is very welcome precision in this game. You know, I never, you never have that feeling of unfairness. You know, I, I never throw my controller and say, "Oh God, it's bullshit." It always, if I'm dead, it was my fault. I was careless, and not a fault of the controls or any sort of confusion in the level design. And I, you know, I think it's interesting. Like, I think you're right, Dan. That there is. Like, it's, it, it's not just nostalgia that this sto this type of, you know, uh, this type of game it stays a part of the landscape and is, like, and really having, like, a renaissance at this moment, you know? There are, there are more of these sort of interconnected, two-dimensional, platformy, shooty uh, adventure games where you're exploring a space and gaining new abilities that let you better explore it than there have been in a very long time. Uh, I think you're, it's you're approaching the uh, the embargo area. Oh, I'm approaching the embargo <laughs> area. Just so I give you a heads up there. Am I really? Um, oh man, I didn't even know there was an embargo. We can let them... Should we should we let them go through and and break our own embargo a little bit? I don't know. I'm tempted to see how he does against the boss. I know this boss. He's a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> He's a jerkus. It's up to you, Tom. Um, yeah, I, I, I think we, we'd better, and then maybe you can go back and try and look for some hidden items. Sure! Alright! Yeah, no problem. I will, I will do that right now. Um, 
Yeah, this is why we are not playing my my still unfinished first session, uh, and why we restarted the game. I was not expecting to make as swift progress this time. I should have uh, I should have gotten damaged. Uh, by the way, everybody, spoiler warning: there is a giant boss behind that red door, and he is a jerk. He is a giant jerk. Uh, Tom, I was about to uh, about to ask you. Uh, what do you think is the most challenging aspect of designing this sort of uh, sprawling exploration-style game? Because there are more of them now, uh, especially in the past three years than there have been in the past, and it's it's becoming clear that part of the reason there aren't that many of these games is that it's very, very hard to make them very well. And, you know, it, there there is a delicate art to... You know, as Dan was saying, making sure that every single tile feels like you're you're in perfect control. And there's a very, you know, there's it's not easy to make a world that feels really, really natural and really, really tight at all times. So what for you was the hardest part of of doing that? And if there's anybody out there who, you know, wants to make their own sort of like Metroid style game, what what's your advice to them? What's the thing um, to look out for? It, I'd say the thing to look out for is um, is largely the things that will seem obvious to you will never seem obvious to the players. Mm. Um, and, you know, there may be some part of your game where you're like, oh yeah, this part, you know, this, this area is completely uninteresting. It's just a transition. You know, the player will just walk through it and not really look at it. Um, and then you'll watch a player go through the playthrough, and they will just, like, be sure that there's something hidden in there. For example, you know, you, you even mentioned the pink blobs where you thought there there was going to be a secret in there. Mm. Um, and in fact, there could be a secret in there, just in this particular playthrough, we did randomly decide to put a secret area in there. Oh, alright! But, you know, um, you have to think of these things a lot because um, players can end up you know thinking oh I really need to go down this one passageway and because of that they're stuck you know they backtrack to some part that they could never get past and they don't realize that they just need to like go up to the right for huh. example and there would be the next boss so uh, you have to um, watch people play um, and see what they do I, I, I guess I was lucky that I had a lot of trade shows to go to so I could just watch people play mm -hmm. and see how they react to different things. Um, and then, you know, you definitely want to, uh, you know, send out send out keys to your friends or other developers that you know um, to get their feedback because they'll, they'll encounter the same thing and they'll be like, hey, like, you know, this one part felt really awkward um, and it'll be something you hadn't, that hadn't occurred to you, so... Uh, it's definitely good to get feedback and get insight from others. I, I find it fascinating. I did not totally realize that some of the secrets in the game are not always set in stone. Uh, that there might have been a secret in that room that just wasn't there when I on this playthrough that I checked out. You know, right now, I, I there was a gray room that I was in, and when you come in from the top, you can see one of the little health nodes below you, but you can't reach it. And the first time I played, I could walk through one of the walls there and go into a secret area. And right. while you were talking, like, I had, like, my brain was go going, like, why isn't there the secret here? I thought it was going to be really cool to show, and n nope, not there this time. How does that work? Um, yeah, so those are, are, are actually randomly placed, so the main, you know, the bulk of the game is, uh, just designed by hand, mm. um, like the part you're in is, but, uh, then there's these randomly generated secret rooms, um, that, uh, they're not just rooms, they're like entire little mini dungeons for you to right. get into, uh, and those are up here in a different place, um, and have a different layout in each playthrough, um, in, in this playthrough, I think I actually saw one uh, that you passed by after the second boss. Oh, really? And, so, you know, it's just, what's the visual signifier? 
if you don't mind saying. Um, like, what should I be looking for? It's it's different for each one, but the way I noticed it was that there were some flickering blocks huh. in the wall, and I think, you know, you probably just didn't notice them because, you know, there's a lot of flickering blocks in the game, um, but those particular ones I knew, like, I hadn't put them there myself, so I figure that's probably a secret area. Man, that's fascinating. Uh, we have a, a little que a question here from Solar Powered B uh, NVG. How do people get away with making a game like this? Does it really service a specific type of group of players? Uh, I think what you're asking there, Solar Power, is, you know, it, it seems like the audience, you, you might be inferring that the audience is uh, small for this. Tom, what, what do you think? Like, I, to me, it feels like this is the kind of game that appeals to everyone. Like, it's, but, you know, how do you get away with making a game like this today? Do you think that there are more players who are willing to embrace this style of game than there were in the past? You know, like... Um, I, I think it's increasing. You know, I've, I've had people explicitly come up to me and say, like, oh, this game looks like Metroid, and I hate Metroid, so I'm not gonna like it. Um, but, uh, and then there's also players that are like, you know, not so much that this looks like a thing I don't like, as it doesn't look like what I do like. It doesn't look like Uncharted. It doesn't look like, um, you know, uh, Call of Duty or Tomb Raider. Um, and I, I think uh, it must be that um, either those people are becoming fewer and further between, or the people that like this kind of game are starting to seek me out because I. I've started to see mostly people that are that are interested in hearing less of, you know, the comments of uh, uh, PlayStation 4 needs the next-gen graphics, where are they? Um, you know, indie gamers are stealing away our AAA games. Please stop the indies from taking away AAA. <laughs> um, <clears throat> which is a ridiculous thing! Which is a ridiculous statement! Uh, I, I, you guys... I, I would I would also add that, you know, if you, I think it's the large publishers who really kind of make a decision on what game to make based on how big the audience is and, you know, looking at different market segments and tailoring a game for a certain demographic. And the thing I really like about indie games is that that is usually not the major consideration in deciding what to make. Right. Um, most people like Tom, um, or most indie developers like Tom, um, first decide, you know, here's the game I want to make. This is the game I want to play. This is the game I, you know, I'm passionate about making. And then there, hopefully, there are people out there who share that passion. And um, because it, you know, Tom's a team of one and, and I'm helping him out and that's, that's pretty much all of it, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, a... Uh, you know, sell five million units and uh, you know be a holiday blockbuster or anything like that it would be it would be great if it did. But um, you know, I think we both just want to be able to continue doing what we're doing. Um, and so, if there are enough people who kind of share the same passions that that we both do, I, I think that's that's enough to uh, to make these very kind of personal, individualized uh, projects. There are, there are, uh, oh, go ahead, Tom, go ahead, please. Um, I was going to say, uh, additionally, um, you know, be because this game is a pub-funded Sony game, um, I think that's also, um, let me backtrack, I'm trying to figure out the right, right way to phrase this, uh, like, in Sony's pub fund, where they offer developers uh, a certain amount of guaranteed royalty returns even if they don't make that mm. uh, I, I you know it's my understanding that they they actually take a loss from that it's more they're doing it um, just for you know the, the goodwill you know the you know uh, community goodwill um, offering you know like something back to the game. Uh, development community and it's it's more you know it's less for profit and more just for you know it, to have to have like it's community building it's it's like yeah. you, you know not not to use an ugly an ugly marketing term but it's brand building so 
you know, if if all of a sudden people who own a PlayStation and who appreciate this type of thing know that they can get it there, then, you know, it, like, the, the financial success becomes less of interest to the platform holder and more about retaining that customer going forward, right? Like, generating good goodwill and word of mouth. Yeah, and I mean, I've had at least two developers, uh, pub fund developers, like, tell me, like, they never actually made, um, you know, back uh, the amount of royalties that Sony advanced them. So, you know, it's allowing these quirky games that would never otherwise see the game, that, like, they, they're not made to make a profit, they're made to enrich the world, basically. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, now you get to experience them because of that. Which is awesome. Uh, you guys were talking about uh, bring, bringing the game to trade shows and finding out how people play the game. Uh, you know, Tom, you were also talking about how the game has changed from when you first conceived it five years ago to the way it's played now. Like, it started out as this, this bionic commando-y, Rygar-y thing, and then, and then changed. But I'm curious how the game changed the more you saw the public playing it. Uh, because that's that's a weird part of the design process that exists now, right? Like, now there is far more opportunity for your audience to play the game before it comes out than there really ever has been. And I, I'm curious how watching people play Axiom Verge changed it. Um... I can remember back in, I think it was 2012, when uh, I released the first trailer, and um, a fellow from GameSpot uh, like asked if I could give him um, like an alpha copy for him to stream. Hmm. And at that time, uh, it the, it was quite a bit different. Like the main character um, looked different. He had a he had a black shirt on, um, and his hair was a dark brown. Um, the, the intro cutscene was completely different, and there was a lot more, like, commentary, um, on the part of the main character. Um, so, you know, I had things in there, like, you know, he would see the first alien and be like, you know, like, holy crap, what is that thing, you know? Hmm. Um, uh, and, uh, like, one of the, one of the first things that happened is people were like, like, oh my god, there's so much talking in this game. Like, you know, and then they were like, Super Metroid didn't have any talking. <laughs> um, and I was sitting here thinking, like, no, the, Super Metroid has that huge opening monologue where Samus, like, talks about what happened in <laughs> Super Metroid 2. Right. And the text scrolls so slowly and it goes for so long, and I have, like, a third of the amount of that text. But the thing is, people don't, you know, in their memories, there was no talking. Right. So it, it's kind of like, well, you know, like, people, you know, w whether they remember it right or not, people don't like to see this much dialogue in a side-scroller. So, uh, you know, that was one one of the things is um, I took out a lot of dialogue. I changed the, uh, the intro story to be more um, dynamic. You know, the whole, the lab explosion scenario. My original thought was that that was going to happen in a flashback hmm. um, as you're playing the game. Um, and the actual intro was more like you know, showing you other events that were less interesting to people. So you know, I changed it and it, you know gave it a little bit of that like uh, out of this world slash another world vibe. Um, uh, trying to think, you know, there's a, there's a lot of little things um, that have to do with trying to direct the player as to where they should go next in the game. Mm. And, and uh, I think uh, I changed a lot of that, particularly in the first few levels, just because, um, you know, I'd watch players and they'd... Uh, like, there's there was a couple of times when it seemed too di direct. Like, I, I do believe that originally you would get the drill and then, like, the next room after the drill, took you to the second area, as opposed to it being more like you first see the, the bricks that you're supposed to drill through to get to the second area, and then you get the drill. Right. You know, um, so a lot of refactoring went. The, the place that you're in right now, uh, where you're in the vertical chamber with the, uh, the laser 
Um, uh, the laser bugs? Laser bugs. <laughs> uh, let's one of them for a second. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. And, um, let's see here. All right. I have glitched him. And now he is... Oh, my God. He's blowing up parts of the wall. Um, you know, so... So I had no idea that could even happen. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things like that. I think our, our audio might be behind from... Oh, no, I guess it is, yeah. There's a little bit of a delay. Yeah. Um, you know, and this came about from uh, just many comments I'd heard, like, oh, that room with the laser bugs is so hard. And I thought, you know, like, well, what if I can give players who are more into the puzzle solving aspect of the game some way to get past this. So there's a lot of little areas where I try to give people an alternative route. That is fascinating. Um, uh, to get past without having to fight the laser bugs every time. Oh man, that is, I like, I ne and see, and the funny thing is, is the, the type of player I am I, I just, I, there are always strategies that I will just forget to try. So I wouldn't have even thought to glitch those guys unless you had said something. And now it just seems so obvious, which is, God, that's so cool. Uh, a little bit of a shout out here uh, before, before we keep going. Uh, Kinglash813, can I have a hug? I've been having a bad day. Dude, very sorry you're having a bad day, and I hope that uh, the stream of Axiom Verge is making it at least a little bit better. Uh, if you are just joining us, this is JXE Streams. My name is Anthony John Agnello. Uh, I am the streams producer here at Engadget.com, and you are listening to uh, Dan Adelman and Tom Happ. And Tom Happ is the the dude who created Axiom Verge, which is out on PlayStation 4 next week, it is $20? Am I remembering that right, Tom? Um, it's nineteen ninety nine, and for uh, PlayStation Plus subscribers, it's 10% off the first week. There you go. Uh, so yeah, and you can check it out. And Dan Adelman is the man who is helping get the word out about this game and representing it and, and doing some of the tricky business of... of making sure that people know a video game exists. Uh, Dan, actually, that's, that's, that's a question I have for you. Sure. What is the biggest challenge about actually getting people to know that a video game is out there in this day and age? It's always been hard. You know, like, yeah. word of mouth has always been more important than a, a print or a television ad, and, like, there are just so many more games now. Just so many more games, and I'm yep. curious about what the secret is to telling people that it exists. You know, I think um, the only secret is a relentless, a re relentless, uh, just persistence. Just continually talking about it, finding people who um, were interested in the game and 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 share that passion. And fortunately. Um, Axie Verge has um, has that kind of connection with a lot of people. Like the first time they play it, they instantly, you know, for a certain group of people, they instantly gravitate toward it, and they, you know, and they share that passion, want to talk about it. So, so that's been very fortunate. Um, it's hard, much much harder to do if the game isn't very good. Um, so, trying to get people excited about a game that isn't itself very exciting is is really challenging and you know you also kind of have to go into it knowing that um you know despite all of your efforts you know all the effort you put into it um probably 80 percent of your effort is going to be wasted so you're you know you're talking about it you're telling people nobody hears about it through you know whatever channel or interview or tweet or whatever but slowly but surely by always kind of Keeping it out there, hopefully the people who are interested in the game will start to notice it. Um, so I think that's that's really the uh, the main thing. That you know, probably the number one thing though is the quality of the game. So mm. if, the, if the game is interesting, it makes it um, a lot easier to to kind of get that mind share and traction because people want to know more about it. Dan, uh, like Dan, this is this is a tough question. You don't have to answer it. I don't want you to get specific because I know you can't get specific. 
But what the hell is it like when you gotta rep a game that you know is a stinker? Is that tough? Is that a tough moment? So, so for me, um, I, I've been fortunate. Um, so, what I'm doing right now, working independently, um, I'm actually, um, since I'm a one-man operation myself, kind of like Tom, I I don't have a lot of time to spend on lots and lots of games. So mm. I wound up being pretty selective, so I'm, I'm fortunate that so far, right now, for example, I'm really only focusing on two games right now. Um, I figure, you know, maybe I could handle three or four, um, but I'm not in a big rush to take on more projects because it's something that, you know, if I'm going to do it, I want to be all. I yeah. don't want to be thinking like, well, you know, I've already spent too many hours on this game. You know, I, I'm not sure there's going to be a payout. It's like, I, the way I think of it is I'm a member of the team. Once I say, you know, I'm in, I'm in, um, and so, so that's that's kind of the way I've I've been uh, approaching things. So fortunately, um, you know, even though I've been approached by games that you know I think a lot of people would consider stinkers, um, but I've also been approached by games that were actually pretty good, but just maybe not my type of game, like mm. um, you know, very maybe you know story rich RPGs, you know, beautiful art style. Um, I'm not a big RPG player. Mm -hmm. So so that might not be my thing. And I, I may not know how to speak to <coughs> RPG players because um, I don't share their language and their passion about those games. So um, so I think um, I've been lucky so far in, in my you know kind of new career after Nintendo to be to be able to pick and choose the, the projects I want to do because I don't need that many to support myself mm. back back when I was at Nintendo though you know um, Nintendo uh, we had a policy that there there is no concept approval process to release your games on the eShop or WiiWare or DSiWare so there were some really really bad games <laughs> Some of that shovelware actually provided some like comedy relief and like how bad they were. Like I, I call people into my office sometimes and like point out like when I got a really terrible game and just you know, <laughs> it's, it's just the nature of the business. So. Um, well, I, I, yeah. I, I, Dan, I find it profoundly relieving to know that even within, even internally, it was understood that some of the stuff that showed up on WiiWare was like. Where where did this even come from? How does yeah. this exist? But at the exact same time, it's how you get things like Muscle March, like that that kind of inane yeah. freedom. Yeah. Well, I mean that's the trade-off, right? If you if you want an open forum for like and welcoming in new ideas, and you don't want like some concept approval process to get in the way, then yeah, you open the floodgates, and a lot of crap is going to come through. Um, I think. Not to get too much on the Nintendo topic, but I think one of the challenges for any platform, really, that has an open policy. Um, Sony now um, also doesn't have a concept review process. Steam is moving much more in that direction. Mm. Um, the big challenge that those platforms face is how can they um, show to consumers the games that they're really going to care about? Because... You know what? You know if there's a thousand new games, but only five of them are any good. You know how does you know a consumer who's not actively tracking all of this stuff all the time? How do they just go in and see which five games they're going to care about? Right. And it's extra tricky because those five games will be different for each person. Yeah. Um, so it's it's not uh, it's not a simple problem to solve. Uh, but you know I think we can all think of games that we thought were going to be duds that turned out to be just amazing. Um, and the example I often come back to is like the first time I played Minecraft. Huh. Um, so there are a lot of YouTube tutorials out there. And, you know, it was this blocky world and I was like punching trees and, you know, gathering resources. Didn't really know what I was doing. Then it got dark and I died. No explanation. <laughs> and I was like, this game sucks. And, you know, and if I had... To, you know, if I were, you know, 
an industry executive trying to decide should I green light this or not, you know, chances are I probably would have said no. Yeah. And I would have walked away from Minecraft. You know, and there's so many examples I know in the early days of Xbox. Uh, the Xbox um, portfolio committee rejected GTA 3. No! That's, really? Uh, that, that, I believe that is, that is what I heard. I, I, I can't say that it's a confirmed uh, statement. Um, but Apocryphal or not, that is amazing. That is an amazing story. So, because, you know, um, people come to things with their own biases and and people are fallible and, and you know, so, so I kind of... I understand the pros and cons of uh, the concept of approval processes. Mm. Um, they're definitely double-edged swords. So as we've been talking, Tom, I found in a wall an amazing fire gun, which I totally missed on my like first playthrough. I didn't even know it was in there. Is that always in there? Or did I find, um, like, a secret? Um, that is, that's always in there. Oh my god. Um, you devious... Oh my god! It's so well hidden, and it's amazing! <laughs> this is a great um, weapon! Yeah, the clue that it's there is there's that little, um... That little indent? There's, there's, a, there's a little indent where you can fire your weapon through, and if you happen to notice, the ricochet mark doesn't hit the wall, it actually goes through the wall. That's, that's the clue to get you to try to explore. You are a tricky individual, my friend. That is awesome. Uh... Man, so, like, Tom, I know that we have people who uh, watch the show and are, are very interested in getting into game design themselves, and, you know, Dan can speak to the business side of working on a game that maybe is not necessarily a, a thing that he is deeply, deeply passionate about. And as somebody who's worked, you know, for hire at a studio, I'm sure you've had experiences where you're, you're working on a game that is not necessarily you know, your dream. It's not Axiom Verge. So, for aspiring game designers, what's your advice for, for sort of dealing with, you know, maybe working with a larger team and uh, working on projects that are, are not going to be your dream project, but is something that's going to pay the bills and let you do the job that you've always wanted? Um, I mean, I, I'd say, because I... I hear a lot of people, they immediately leave school, you know, they graduate from college and then uh, they think that they're, you know, going to make the next Super Meat Boy. Mm. Um, but I think that's that's kind of the rarity and I think it's probably a good idea to get used to the idea of working for a larger company like EA or, you know, whatnot, whatever's maybe closest to your house. Um, because... THQ! Acclaim! No way. No. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, pick the ones that, you know, still exist. Um, <laughs> and it, it's not, you know, and they're, they're not all bad. Like, you know, a, a lot of times you'll hear these reports like, oh, yeah, it's just this, you know, this slog. It's like working in the accounting department of the most boring financial firm. It's not like that. It's still way better than your average day job working, you know, even if you're just working on some you know, iterative, uh, you know, sports, um, game by EA, like, that's still a really cool job to have. Right. And I, you know, that's a good way to spend your day, um, you know, working so that on the weekend you can make the next Super Meat Boy. Um, and I, I would, that's what I would sort of encourage, like, the aspiring designers to do is to, you know, not be afraid to do that and get your feet wet, like, learn, uh, in those environments where you're surrounded by other like, extremely intelligent people, um, just kind of like soaking in all the knowledge and all of the experience um, that, that these companies have to offer, and then, uh, you know, gradually you'll gain the experience too yourself uh, for, you know, when you want to strike out on your own, or maybe you'll decide you don't want it. What would you say is the single biggest way that working for an outside studio impacted your work on Axiom Verge? Um, I think mainly it's, uh, it meant that there were much less unanswered questions for me. So I think a lot of times, uh, it seems like, 
beginning developers don't, uh, you know, basic things like they've never written a game before, um, uh, or like they get to a part, uh, you know, outside of what they learned in school, and you know, they're now they're like, okay, what's what's the way to make AI for enemies, and they might, you know, go and design something way more complicated than they need, or they don't do enough. Hmm. Um, whereas if you've worked for a larger company and you've seen it before, and you're like, even if I didn't do this part, um, I know that basically, you know, the way it works is that, you know, I, I want to modularize the, uh, the levels of the game, and I want there to be, you know, uh, you know, some concept of creature spawns and whatever, and you don't need to ever stop and think, what do I do next, because you... You, you know, you you know enough to have made your schedule and kind of know um, the ropes, so to speak. There's not. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I don't. Yeah, no, I, I think that that yeah. totally makes sense. That makes complete sense. Um, yeah. Uh, so we're we're heading into the the last ten minutes here, and. Uh, Tom, I, I'm going to ask you to do to do me a solid here and tell me what I might be missing. Uh, other than I, other than the sections that where we we dare not tread right now, uh, is there anything that you would you could say that I've missed in these these uh, accessible areas? I unfortunately am stuck in the steam room. I cannot jump high enough to get back to the previous area. Yeah, and that's, a, that's a sneaky one there. I'm thinking that since we're to the end, maybe you should try and head up to that boss, and uh, we can just show our viewers what that third boss looks like. All right. Do you, yeah, you think I, that's I think that's good? Done and done, my um, friend. If you go up to the right, um, like heading back to that boss, mm -hmm. uh, I, I know our, the, the audio and the video are not synced up, so what I'm seeing may be different, but if you go into that tunnel just to the right... Um, there's a secret in that room. Um, it looks like a, a long corridor with two kind of roundish um, creatures along the, the ground. Okay. Um, so two in round. that hallway, there is a, a secret in there. All right. I'm going to make it happen here. Uh... <laughs> and now it's showing up on my video. You're, you're in the room that I was thinking of. You may already be in. Oh, I'm already on the other side. All right. No, I'm going back in. All right, I'm in. Let's see here. I'm gonna no, glitch. Not the, not the vertical one, though. Right, the one right before it. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. he's probably he's ahead of us. But we're a few seconds. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Aha! Uh Aha! -huh. Uh -huh. Look at that! Oh my God, Tom, devious. Right. I mean, the clue here is is you know there's that section of darker colored uh, bricks. Um, right above. You know, leading upwards. Oh man, that is so tricky. So, question. Now, Metroid backed away like backed away from the sort of like no hints when there is an item in the room after Super Metroid, like after Super Metroid when there was an item in the room, there would be like an icon on the map. Why did you choose to not have that? Um, cuz for me, you know, I, I don't know, maybe it's just because the first Metroid I played was the NES Metroid with no help at all. Mm. Um, I think it's also um, not having something pointing out exactly where each individual thing is um, adds a bit more mystery because when you have that icon on the map, it's almost like breaking the fourth wall and telling you, hey, this was a game designed by a game designer and he decided there's something in this room so he let you know by marketing on the map. Um, Whereas I feel like if you find it on your own, it's almost more like gives you a little bit of that feeling that, you know, the world was real and this was just part of the world before you ever came into it. Um, or, you know, before uh, it was ever designed, you know. Um, and uh, I forgot where I was going with that. Tom, every now and again, you say something about the process of making this, and it makes me wish I could just reach through the phone and high-five you. I, I swear to God, man. Like, that that is a miraculous answer. Uh, because it really does. It really does make the world feel alive. And, and 
and stranger, you know? Like, you want it, you, like, you want it to feel mysterious. The, the mystery draws you forward. If you, if you see that little icon on the map, uh, saying, you know, uh, you know, uh, oh, there's something in here, it stops you in your tracks, and you sort of become obsessive about trying to find it in the room, or trying to do the, you know, the special platforming maneuver that it's going to take to get it. Uh, but yeah, and, and Fat Buddha in the chat is like, absolutely, high five. Uh, Origami Kid has another question for you in the chat. How many bosses are there in the game? And are they all as ter- are they all as terrifying and disgusting as this one? Because it is gross, and I love it. Uh, yes, we are now fighting the third boss in the game, which is so tricky. Yeah, and also, apologize, uh, apologies, I saw a lot of people in the comments saying, you know, oh, I don't want any, any hints, I feel like I'm cheating, so apologies that I gave out a little hint. It's not going to change the game materially. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Believe there's there are many, many, many secrets. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You walked right by so many of them. <laughs> <laughs> no! It's kind of painful to watch somebody else play because it's just like, oh, you, got, you forgot to get the thing, and, and you have to remember, like, oh, they have to discover the thing. <laughs> oh, wait, they're, they're playing it the way they're supposed to play it. Damn! Yeah. Uh, five times already. Tom, while we're while we're fighting this this grotesque freak with its brain hanging out, like tell me about the bosses, like because designing bosses is really really tricky, man. Like you want it to be harder than the average enemy, but you don't want it to be frustratingly hard, and you don't want them to last too long. Like I I know that sometimes I'll play a game and I'm like, why am I still fighting this boss? It's not interesting anymore. But, like, you're, you know, I've only fought four of the bosses in my own playthrough, but, like, they all feel, you know, they feel appropriate, you know? Like, the, 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 the balance of the challenge is just right. So, like, what's the secret, man? Um, there's... There's really no way to do the bosses except for, at least i found, is to start programming them, um, and then once you have something in there, try and play it. Um, and most of the time, I found that the bosses really suck until you actually play it and start to change them to make them, you know, more manageable. So for this guy that you're, you're looking at, uh, you notice there's a lot of purple blocks uh, hanging um, from those, those strands. Um, you know, in, the, in that case, it was basically, I had these restrictions, like the boss can't, he's so big, he can't really move. Um, so he has to stay in place and shoot at you. And then I had to really work about, work, work on giving you something that you can hide behind, you know, for defense, but that also doesn't make it so there's a spot where you can stand and just be invincible and kill them. Mm. So, uh, and it went that way for most of the bosses I had. I made them and sometimes I found out like, oh, you know, the way I made this boss just isn't going to work at all. I've got to redraw some of his art and, you know, he's got to be able to maybe, you know, have the ability to jump or, you know, some other addition like that. <clears throat> and then I, then I just played them. Um, and, you know, I think, and then, like I said before, like, another thing you need is to either watch other people playing it or get them build so they can give you their feedback. And a lot of times we're like, man, I got up to that one boss and he just seemed like it was disproportionately hard compared to the rest. Mm. And then I'm like, okay, you know, like, maybe I can do this or that, you know, make it so the boss uses its shield less or, you know, um, uses its other attack that's easier to defend against more. Kind of thing. Now, I like this, this is something I, I always love asking. We talk a lot about you know sort of how things have changed in development and how playtesting is so necessary and like perfecting something like a boss. Is there anything in the game that you wanted in there just more than anything in the world that like an idea that you just loved but it just didn't work and you had to get rid of it? Um. I think I eliminated those like pretty early on. Like I said, the you know the Bionic Commando 
uh, grappling slash disarmor weapon um, seemed so great in my head, um, but I couldn't do that. Um, I think for the most part, like, once I narrowed those down, uh, there, there wasn't really anything that I had to cut. Um, you know, there, there I think was a, a boss that was just sort of like a... I can't even tell you about this boss because it was just so <laughs> disgusting and like almost like ethically uh, polarizing that I was I was like I can't even have this boss anymore and wow I I replaced I replaced that boss with like a completely different character and I had to like redraw you know I basically spent a month like remaking that boss because. The original idea was, like, this doesn't fit, it's too disgusting even for this game, and <laughs> <laughs> it's changing it. It looked like it was straight out of an old Tool video. Uh... Um, yes, it was It was very much like some, you know, something the Tool would have thought of in the latest <laughs> Well, uh, Tom, Dan, guys, thank you so much for being on the show today. Like, I... I I I was first told about Axiom Verge about 18 months ago, and uh, a couple of friends had seen it, and they they said, "Oh man, this this is your crack. This is the kind of game that you love." And I have actually at events in the past year been avoiding playing demos of it, uh, specifically because I wanted to wait until it was done and sort of uh, experience it fresh for myself. And the the wait was well worth it, my friend. Like it it is, it is spectacular. Uh, so the all the work you put in was was well worth it. Um, everybody, thank you for joining us for the stream. Uh, if you've been hanging out with us for the full two hours, uh, you rock. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone, to the 11th Annual Engadget Awards. It's